Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to GW Center for Integrative Medicine YouTube channel. have a very special guest to you. From, we will talk about what, what she does in a minute. Um, but uh, just to kind of su summarize, so we have this very long-standing relationship at GWCI and we thrive again, physical therapy practice with Jessica Prowse and her team. So today is just continuation of this conversation. So today we are meeting with Dr. Mary Ellen Kramp. Uh, Mary Ellen graduated from Springfield College in 1992 with a master's in science degree in physical therapy and received her doctorate from Boston University in 2005. Uh, she's certified in a lot of different things, um, lymphedema therapy and women's health um, decades. So that, that would be covering bladder, bowel dysfunction, sexual dysfunctions, all, all, all things women's health. And um, you know, she's been in practice for over 30 years. And one of the reasons we're talking today is because for the past, I guess, a decade plus, and, and Marianne will tell us more, she's been very uh, engaged in this kind of a, what we describe as a visceral manipulation. It's a bit more complicated than that. Um, she'll tell us all about it. But she's done a lot of specific trainings and she's incorporating that in her practice. Um, She's treating a very broad um, number of conditions. So some of them even include oncological rehab. Um, and she's a teacher. So she's going to talk to us about her relationship uh, and published case series in Journal of American Osteopathic Association. And we're very happy because she recently moved to DC. And that's why we're meeting. So Mary Ellen is probably the latest addition to Thrive Again. And uh, uh, for full disclosure, uh, I did have Mary Ellen put her magical hands on me, so I've, I'm a, uh, I guess the 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 recipient of the care here. So I can tell you that it's a very, I'm not even sure how I would describe this, but it's a very powerful technique. It feels somewhat in between energy work and massage, um, with a pretty significant shifts. Um, that you don't know this, Mary Ellen, but I will tell you. So I uh, I have this chronic GI problems, and after your work, there's definitely been a shift. Like there's no question that I had a pretty significant shift, and it's kind of long standing. Now I, I think we did this treatment at least a month ago. Yeah, at least if not more. Yeah, and I usually treatments like this, like you know, I've had a lot of body work over the years, and they usually would last for like a couple of weeks, I would say. But yours has been lasting a lot longer. So with that preamble, um, you know, I, I think let's start with just, you know, tell us about what is the, what is visceral manipulation? What are you doing? I mean, <laughs> tell me, because you did something, I felt it, but <laughs> more explanation now. Okay, well, visceral manipulation, it, it sounds a lot harsher than it is. And what it actually is, um, is all the organs are surrounded by connective tissue. They're surrounded by fascia. And they have ligaments that are connecting them to the skeletal system. Mm -hmm. So just as we would look at the range of motion of the wrist, um, we'd work on the ligaments within the wrist. We would work on the muscles that are going th through there. Um, we can work on the same connective tissue and ligaments that are with in around and supporting all of the internal organs. So like the heart is surrounded by the pericardium. So it's sitting in a sack of connective tissue. There's this beautiful array of um, ligaments that attach that pericardium to the sternum. There are ligaments that attach the pericardium to the neck. So back in PT school, we were taught, you know, somebody gets in a car accident, they have whiplash, um, you know, and then they have this forward head posture. Well, we got to strengthen, 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 get them to bring their chin back, do a chin tuck, do a chin tuck. Well, in that accident, that ligament got whiplashed. So that ligament took, you know, the forces of that accident. So mm -hmm. there can be spasm, um, you know, there's um, contractile property within ligaments and within connective tissue. So it's not just sitting there static those are able to contract as well. So that ligament from the pericardium to the vertebral bodies may be contracted. 
And that's what's holding that posture forward. Yeah. So thousands of chin tucks and strengthening um, is the person still going to be fighting to hold their neck in a proper alignment. And so it's still going to be leading to chronic neck pain, but mobilizing that ligament that's going from that pericardium up to the bodies of the vertebrae in the neck, that can then allow the person to easily just maintain that posture. So, and it's not something where, you know, it, it was visceral manipulation was developed by a French osteopath. And so English wasn't his first language. And the English speakers were saying, please don't name it that. Please don't, because it sounds, it sounds really harsh, but it's not. It is, like you said, quite gentle. It's somewhere between energy work and in, in massage. It's extremely specific. So we're targeting that particular ligament and bringing a little bit of tension into it waiting for the body to respond and following that response. So it's not like we're going in there with an elbow and, mm -hmm. and noogieing the crap out of it. We're following what the body wants to do. So um, this can really impact the body's ability to hold a posture. It can really impact the body's ability to move. So with the liver, you have the liver that's um, sitting um, underneath the ribs on the right side, for the most part of the body. Uh, above that, you have the diaphragm. Below mm -hmm. that, you have a kidney. Mm -hmm. And you go to take a deep breath in, if that ligament, if that liver does not want to move because its ligaments and its connective tissue are really tight, it's gonna be really hard for that person to take a deep breath. Mm -hmm. It's going to kind of lock the ribs down. So when that same person tries to move their shoulder, they may be able to get up here, but instead of just a nice flowy motion, they're fighting to they're get fighting. up here, which mm -hmm. will lead to shoulder pain after a while. Mm -hmm. So, and that's just from the liver trying to maintain that tension in, in that position. So mobilizing the liver, all of a sudden the diaphragm can move down. That person can take a deeper breath. Mm -hmm. um, that shoulder can move freely instead of, fighting to move where it needs to. So provocative question. So is it true then that pretty much every chronic pain will have some visceral component? I mean, sometimes a musculoskeletal issue is a musculoskeletal issue. So, you know, somebody who has a chronic elbow pain, is there going to be a visceral component? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, somebody who has a chronic shoulder pain, almost always. Back pain, yes. Um, uh -huh. but you know, so if, the, if the pain is not localized to some peripheral small structure or smaller structure, probably safe to assume that majority of, of, of patients will have some visceral aspect. I, I find that yes. Hmm. And yet nobody does this. There, there's, it's, it's getting <laughs> more and more popular. Um, as the years have gone on, I started doing visceral work back in the nineties Mm -hmm. um, and har hardly anybody was doing it back then. And I am um, seeing a lot more in the pelvic world and Thrive Again, we do a lot of uh, bowel, bladder, sexual dysfunction. Mm -hmm. At Thrive Again, we all do some uh, visceral work and we all understand how important it is. If somebody's coming in with a bowel problem or a bladder problem, how do you treat a bowel and a bladder without treating the bowel and the bladder? You know. Mm -hmm. Tra very traditional pelvic PT is focusing more on the muscle. So the pelvic floor itself, mm -hmm. but ignoring actually mobilizing the bladder. So if somebody say has um, urgency issues, so they have to go um, very suddenly. Well, why is that? So if the bladder starts to fill and you have a uterus sitting on right on top of that, and you have small intestines sitting right on top of that, if the uterus is stuck or if the small intestine is stuck, mm -hmm. then what can happen is that bladder starts to fill and normally the pressure from within on the walls of the bladder, tell the brain, okay, tell her that she needs to go pee. Um, as it's expanding with pressure from on top, that signal is going to come abruptly. It's going to come far sooner than it needs mm -hmm. to. 
Mm. So that person changes position. You have to remember that the organs aren't just static in there as they're going to change position as you change position. Mm -hmm. So you go to stand up after sitting on the couch for a while, all of a sudden, everything's in a slightly different position. The pressures are different and you get that sudden urge need to go pee now. And that's because that uterus isn't moving or the intestines aren't moving and allowing the expansion mm -hmm. of the bladder to do what it needs to. Mm -hmm. So mobilizing the ligaments that are supporting the uterus can really make a huge difference in that person who has urgency issues or frequency issues. So they may find, oh, you know, I have to get up four times a night to pee. Well, if that bladder isn't able to expand the way it needs to, yeah, during the day you're going every hour, at night you're going every two hours, it, you know, that's waking you up, waking you up, waking you up. We take the um, uterus, mobilize that, the small intestine, the peritoneum that sits around the small intestine and mobilize that, all of a sudden the bladder has more space to expand. Neurologically, the body isn't getting those signals as quickly um, that you need to pee because it can expand the way it needs to. So can we go back to my, to my case? Sure. Um, so, yeah, I didn't expect that. So I came to see you guys because I'm training for this, for this race. And I just wanted just to check in. I'm actually, for the past few months, I've been feeling rather well. But you put your hands on my belly and then you did something. So, so what <laughs> did you do exactly with me? And okay, let me give a, a little preface. It's okay. I, I can, I mean, I don't have any bad problems, but I definitely have IBS my most of my life. Probably started in my, actually, I tell you exactly when it started. So it started when I was in, before medical school. So a couple of years before medical school, I was, um, I had H. pylori. So I developed this kind of, a sudden shift in digestive tract. So I went to a gastroenterologist, they did a scope and they said, oh, you have gastritis and you have H. pylori. So they gave me antibiotics and the, the, the triple pack. And that made me really sick, like, like I remember. And since then I never fully recovered, but that was the beginning of all this sort of, what let's just call it IBS. And so it's quite common. I would be bloated. There would be some tender spots in the belly. They would come and go randomly in, any, in no particular. Like I know certain foods will trigger it. I try to stay away from that. So in that context, what did you do to me? <laughs> well, in a context like that, um, what I would do is I would check the stomach, check the mobility of the stomach, check where the sphincters are. Um, so the lower esophageal sphincter at the top of the stomach, the pleuric sphincter at, you know, where the small intestine starts, um, where the um, pancreatic duct and the common bile duct come into the duodenum in the small intestine. And then the ileocecal valve is another huge component there. And those being dysregulated can make digestion um, really difficult. For some people, it will go mm -hmm. toward constipation others it'll go toward mm -hmm. diarrhea um so starting with that is huge tension in the mobility of any part of the small bowel the stomach the colon itself that can create irritation and either send someone into a cycle of diarrhea send others into a cycle of constipation so just getting everything um, mobilized. So mechanically, everything is optimal mm -hmm. is, is my goal for that. I also add in a lot of vascular component, um, mm -hmm. and some neurological, because if the, um, the nerves coming in and feeding the gut are, um, either feeling like they're sitting there like a lump or they are, you know, <laughs> in a frenzy that can impact the gut motility as well. And then the vascular component, if there's a lot of tension um, along the vasculature, the superior mesenteric artery or inferior mesenteric artery, that can impact what's going on um, with the gut as well and how, what the uh, peristalsis is like. So your perceptual awareness with your fingers is sort of, you know, miles above an average. 
Um, what are you feeling like when you sensing the tissues underneath, right? You, you're sensing not just organs. I mean, you're sensing very fine structures. I mean, you're sensing nerves, you're sensing, you're sensing ligaments, etc. You know, it's for a regular medical provider who's in the standard Western model, that's probably borderline quackery. <laughs> yes, for those of I mean, I'm trained in some basics of osteopathy and craniosacral therapy, and I and I'm not anywhere near your level, but even I have some perceptual capacity that I would say defines that kind of standard understanding, right? Um tell us tell us tell our listeners a little bit about that. Like, like what do you actually like? How does this evolve? Like how how do you go from being a student here and then learning how to sense this deeper and deeper? A, a lot of it is understanding anatomy. It comes down to anatomy, 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 and feeling where the tensions are underneath my fingers, how large a space, it, you know, am I feeling uh, the tension in? What mm -hmm. direction is that tension going? What is the depth of that? So you really have to think 3D as you're, mm -hmm as you're palpating. So as I'm feeling someone's abdomen, you know, when I, I'm teaching a class, I teach, okay, well, if you have your hand on your chest and, you know, I ask you, okay, go ahead and feel the skin temperature. Sure, you can feel the skin temperature. Okay, um, as you're talking, you can feel the vibrations of your voice through your sternum. Um, you know, without really even pressing, you can notice the difference between the skin and the sternum. And you could probably feel a little bit of fat layer in between. And mm -hmm. if you're really still, you're going to feel your breath. You're mm -hmm. going to feel your pulse. You can feel all that. You haven't changed what you're doing with your hand. It's a matter of where you're changing your focus to. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of that going on. And I've done this long enough and, you know, understanding the principles of how the body works. So the body is going to protect um, arteries, veins, and nerves to the hilt. So if there's tension on an artery, a vein, or a nerve, everything around it tends to lock down. And it feels more like a block of mm -hmm. tissue mm -hmm. versus individual structures. Mm -hmm. um, if it's just the a section of small bowel that's tight, it's it feels like just a little, um, almost like a ball in there where I can, I can feel that section of muscle within the wall of that um, small bowel just kind of spasming a bit versus if it's the superior mesenteric artery that's really tight, a whole section of that small bowel is tight instead of, you know, one little component and the back is locked up. And a section of the spine is locked up because the body's going to protect around that. And because it's running across, um, you know, the psoas muscle in there, the psoas is going to be tight. You're going to have limited lumbar flexion. You're going to, so there's so many components that are going to play into it. The person's not going to be able to flex well. They're not going to be able to extend well. So looking at everything as a whole, but also bringing your hands into it and feeling where's where's the, uh, what structures are tight, um, that, that really kind of brings in the whole picture mm -hmm. and that's a perfect segue. So what are the common patterns you're seeing? Like, I presume there are certain patterns of whether it's a trauma or just chronic illness that shows up in that sort of repetitive other, you know, many people will have that. What do the typical patterns look like and what do they come as a syndromes? Like what does it present to you? Like what are the patients coming complaining about? Um, well, about which <laughs> I mean, I I treat Any, everything head to toe I mean, I, yeah, no particular. Well, let's can we let's stick with GI since we sort of started covering it. I, I don't want us to because we can go any whichever way and we'll never leave this room. <laughs> No, but like, let's just stick with something. Let's just stick with GI since we're talking about my case. Okay. So if we, if somebody with GI problems, so we'll start with um, reflux, somebody coming in with reflux, there's usually uh, a lot of tension within the wall of the stomach itself. Mm -hmm. There is usually um, 
a ton of tension in the lower esophagus and the lower esophageal sphincter. And you can feel it typically um, seventh rib medially. Mm -hmm. if there's If you press on that, um, it's usually exquisitely tender. So doing uh, some, I, actually what I do is I bring the body around that tension and just wait for the body to release that. And usually holding that for about a minute to get the body to release that. But I mean, so that particular nice. pattern is very, very common. Sometimes there's tension in the diaphragm and there can also be tension in the pleura around the lungs holding that. So the treatment methods then are all over the place, right? So, cause you just described kind of the strain, counter strain. Right, yes. Right? Um, I, I blend a lot of my treatments. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So yeah, I will use strain, counter strain quite a bit. Um, I use the visceral manipulation is, um, a, it's more of a direct treatment, but really, really uh, gentle. Um, so I will do a combo. So I'm doing more a direct treatment onto the stomach itself for, um, for somebody with reflux. I will do a, another technique called a recoil on, which I did on you, um, on the ribs, uh -huh. um, to mobilize the, the pleura uh -huh. and, um, so yeah, they're, they're several different techniques that can be done. Um, but for, you know, somebody with reflux, that's, that's a pretty common scenario is tension in the pleura, tension in the diaphragm, tension in the esophagus and the stomach, um, and in those two sphincters. So getting those, um, all settled, you know, I've been able to resolve a lot of reflux, but, you know, it also depends on, what else is going on in that person's system. So I can take the mechanical portion and, and treat that, but if they have H. pylori and they have other um, things going on, um, uh, food sensitivities and stuff that are creating that, you know, I need you to help the patient with uh, that aspect of it, but I can help, um, you know, hit the mechanical side of things. So let's talk a little bit about your practice itself, you know, rather than like specific medical issues. So, so, I mean, generally speaking, most physical therapists will have some kind of a cadence, right? Like you'll see patients every couple of weeks, every month or so. Um, how often you would like to see patients? Like what would be the typical course of treatment look like? Just give us a little bit of sense of that. Um, typical course of treatment is uh, weekly. And just depending on what I'm seeing them for, mm -hmm. it, it you know, if it's something like reflux and it's just an easy mechanical thing, I only need to see them once or twice. If it's something more complicated, been really long standing, they have numerous other things going on. Oh yeah, I've got neck pain. Oh yeah, I have IBS. Oh yeah, I have um, really horrible periods and you know so forth and so on. Those end up being months instead of just you know two or three treatments. Mm -hmm. So yeah, weekly is usually the how often I I treat people. Mm -hmm. Cool, very good. All right, and you know before I let you go, tell us a little bit about the research and the educational stuff you're doing because you know I'm particularly interested in that series of case reports. I'm a huge fan of case series and case reports. I feel like we undervalue the, mm -hmm. the sort of n of one, if you will. Mm -hmm. And we sort of rely on in our Western model on this, you know, controlled trials. And the problem is often humans are not controlled trials, humans are individuals. And so translating the data from controlled trial to the individual in the room is not all that straightforward. So with that in mind, particularly I'm interested in those case series you were. Okay. So um, I published a case series a while ago in the Journal of the American Osteopathic Association. And that one, I looked at um, doing these treatments for fertility. So I treated 10 women who were infertile by CDC definition. They had been trying for at least a year. Um, the, the group of 10 I had was between one and seven years. They had been trying to get pregnant. Um, 
some of them had been successful in the past and so and they just couldn't get pregnant again and a block of them couldn't get you know had never been able to get pregnant so these particular women it was um let's see an average of 2.3 treatments is what i ended up doing with these women um and within three months after the treatments um six out of the 10 were pregnant and um, went on to have a normal delivery. So um, what did you do? Like what was the typical? So what I did was, you know, what I was just trying to do was to optimize the reproductive environment. So I looked at the pelvis and I too uh, did a lot of osteopathic training. My husband's a DO. And uh, when he was in medical school, I was blessed to have our uh, rehab director also be the director of the manipulative medicine department at the medical school. And he asked me to uh, attend the labs and I was more than eager to. So I learned a lot of the osteopathic techniques there. So, um, so I started out by using muscle energy to align the pelvis. And then I looked at it from a visceral standpoint, how, what is the mobility of the uterus? What is the mobility of the ovaries? What's the, um, you know, vascular tension from the ovarian artery and vein? What is the lymphatic flow out of the pelvis? So I just took things um, kind of system by system and treated that way. And a normal couple trying to conceive in three months, about 57% uh, will conceive. And at six months, it's 75%, 85% at a year. So with that three month follow up, I had six out of 10 able to get pregnant, which brings them back to your average couple, which so I thought that was really cool how those numbers lined up. That's incredible. I mean, you know, I have not heard of this level of direction, because, you know, usually in fertility, we talk about you know, more cellular level, like not, not this macro level, right? We're talking usually, oh, you know, there's like something wrong with the ovaries or something. There's, yeah. we usually go straight into sort of cellular mechanism of why this is happening. And you, you looking at it at the macro level and causing such a, such a profound, you know, effect. There. Right. So, so it makes you... me, makes me really wonder, I mean, are we missing massive component of this larger pieces in so many healthcare problems, even the ones we presume to be purely biochemical. I mean, there are probably mm -hmm. mechanical components that we need to look into. Right. I mean, that's my very biased view as well. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, if I'm looking at a uterus, and if you look in at the anatomy pictures, of the ligaments supporting the uterus, you have the vasculature for the uterus going through those, through that fascia. And if the uterus is sitting like this within the pelvis, because the woman got thrown off a horse and landed on her sacrum and everything got torsioned in her um, pelvis, is the blood flow truly optimal to the uterus? Is she, is she able to build the endometrium that she needs to um, if everything is askew and, and all the imaging and everything will be completely normal, right? Though right. everything will be missed, completely. right? Because there's no the the any kind of or even 3D reconstruction will still miss it all because they're they're reconstructing it in one plane. They can't reconstruct it in every single plane. And when you feeling it, you invariably feeling living tissue. It's, mm -hmm. it's constantly moving and shifting imaging cannot do that there, there's just no mechanism for that right it's impossible you can't you can't i mean unless you're actually looking in imaging in a life continuous movement structure but i'm not aware of any imaging that does that right and that's fascinating yeah well and also you know a uterus sitting like this and a uterus sitting like you know this and mm -hmm. you know even if it's slightly you know retroflex they're still going to call that normal they're going to call it normal yeah. And they're not even going to question that there, this could be somehow linked to a problem. Like right. it's, it's going to be presumed as a completely normal being. And frankly, I'm guilty the same way. Like I never thought that, that wow, wow, 
All right. Well, I have a strong feeling <laughs> it's the first of many. Um, I feel I, I have like like myriads of ideas of my in my head. Like, okay, we got to talk about long COVID. We got to talk about you know this types of chronic pain, and got to talk about uh, connective tissue disorders like EDS, and got to talk about so many things. But I think we're going to end on this today. I think this All is right. a great start. Um, everybody, this is Dr. Mary Ellen Kramp, uh, one of the newest additions to our beloved Thrive Again PT, um, a practice that's, you know, kind of, we will call it partners, affiliates, whatever. You can find the links, of course, in descriptions of this video. If you forget about that, you can just go to our own gwcm.com and, and we have Thrive Again listed in our affiliates. And with that, everybody have a wonderful day. Um, if you're not blown away by this conversation, hope we'll blow you away by some other conversation and I hope you'll come back and subscribe to this channel. Thank you, everybody. See you soon. Stay well, friends. Bye.